In today's show, we look back at the players who took the biggest leaps forward in shooting, field goals, free throws, two-point percentage, three-point percentage, and just check how much that influenced our perception of them for the season. Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at basketballmonster.com. And you can find me on Twitter as always at redrock underscore b-ball, on TikTok at redrock underscore b-ball, and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Thank you for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free. We are available on all platforms. We're here with the show talking about some people who improve their shooting. Again, this is pre-recorded a week and a half or so in advance as I am... Ah, At the time this is out, I've probably just left Vegas and just having a couple of days break uh, over in North America. And I'll be back back soon for live recorded shows. We're talking about players that took big steps forward in shooting percentages. Why is this important? I'll tell you why it can be important to note is that a couple of things. Shooting percentages, their influence can be impacted by volume, but the overall number is not to do with whether a player necessarily got more usage or played more minutes. Right. Shooting percentage changes, not based on that. But the other thing it is, is that they are multi-category influences. Field goal percentage, well, let's start with free throw percentage. It influences two categories. If you improve your free throw percentage while attempting the same amount of attempts, you will score more points. So your points go up and your free throw percentage goes up. So changes in free throw percentage impact two categories. Three-point percentage influences three categories. If you improve your three-point percentage, your field goal percentage goes up, assuming the two-point percentage is kept the same. Your three-point is made, go up, and your points scored, go up. So as a single variable, assuming attempts and everything else stays the same, which is not always the case, but assuming all that stays the same, if you improve your three-point percentage, you get boosts in three categories. You become a worse three-point shooter, you become worse in three categories. So changes of four, five, six percentage points in this category can influence 33% of the overall categories in fantasy basketball and make your season look way better or way worse than it actually was. Paying attention to who was able to take the biggest leaps will often correlate, not always, but will often correlate to the guys that were the big breakouts or the surprise drop-off and busts. And often those players can reverse course in a positive or negative way the following season, and then they go back to being you know, breakouts or busts or however you want to apply that label. But it's just a lot of it based on shooting percentage numbers. Okay, so let's talk about the guys that did improve their shooting and the guys that were worse at shooting. Warning. Let's get it on, Gilly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's look at two-point percentage. Let's look at the guys, the top four players. And I had to use some sort of cutoffs and filters. I don't want guys that you know, were the 500th best player. That doesn't make sense. All of these players, though, were top 200 players this season. And we wanted guys with decent enough volume for it to make some sense to include them here. We saw Trey Murphy. And we talked about this on yesterday's show, one of the biggest rises in overall fantasy ranks from season to season. Well, there you go. Because his two-point percentage went from 42% as a rookie, which is putrid, up to 61%. We saw him be able to finish at the rim with power, dunking on people, driving, getting more confidence. So part of the reason he was able to jump 300 ranking spots, or close enough to that, was the fact that he went from 13 to 31 minutes. Absolutely no denying of that. But if he had have played 31 minutes and shot 39% from the field, or 42% from two, as the number is here, well, he wouldn't have been a top 100 guy. He would have been a player that would have only been rosterable in punt field goal percentage builds and not someone that was useful across the board. And our level of hype for Trey Murphy heading into the season, I think this year would be much lower than what it currently is. And I think the hype is justified for Murphy without any real question. 
I think yeah, finding where the role is in the minutes is going to be a little dicey in enough shots. But in terms of being an elite shooter, strong driver, good finisher, I think all that is real for him. But if that 61 goes to 55 or whatever it is, um, that, that impacts it. That drops his overall efficiency down, maybe from the 48% field goals to 46 and it's enough to take him from the 80th best player. Then he loses two minutes because Zion and Ingram both play over 50 games somehow. Then that impacts him. And you draft him at 85 or thinking, well, it's going to be a breakout third-year guy. Let's go into 65 for Trey. And then that shooting falls away. Well, you are in trouble with that. This is not for me to shit on Trey Murphy or say he's not a breakout player or he's a really good option moving forward because I haven't done any projections on it. And I don't know what the team's going to look like at this point. But let's just say... It's it's not necessarily red flaggy, but it's a little it's a little um you gotta just watch for it. You gotta watch for it. That's that's what we're trying to say. I think we look at the big ragu as a big improver too. Also, coincidentally, one of the names featured on the biggest fantasy rank rises from yesterday, where DiVincenzo shot thirty seven point three percent in twenty one twenty two as a member of the Bucks and the Kings. It went up to 53% as a member of the Warriors. Now, as at this point, DiVincenzo is a free agent. I don't know where he signs. 37% on twos is just an unrealistic number. So while we can look at Murphy improving massively to 61 and think, yeah, well, he's not a 42% guy, but he's maybe not a 61% guy. I look at DiVincenzo and go, 52 is completely reasonable for him to be a 52% two-point shooter up from 37. And there's no real reason why that can't stick for Dante. Part of what his issue is going to be, it's going to be roll. What are his minutes? What's his usage? What's his team? I think the shooting has rebounded to be um, yeah, back to where it needs to be or back to where it should be or back to where we can expect it to be. The third guy we look at here is Grimey. This briefcase and this haircut. Now, this is what happens often for first or second year players, and we've got two examples on this list. But Quentin Grimes went from 50% on his twos to 64% on his twos. Now, 64% is obviously insanely high and if he was put into a more focused offensive role with more usage he wouldn't most likely be able to maintain that but him being able to be that efficient enabled him to get a solid role now we still have the problems in New York currently as they stand without me knowing what has happened with the quickly Barrett Brunson Grimes quartet and how they get enough minutes to be successful one of them guys goes down and all of them become not Barrett but all of them become standard league options but often the minutes and that can be a little bit squishy in terms of how Thibodeau runs that. But that big improvement from Grimes, I wouldn't say it's a linear path and he's going to improve again up to 67 or 68. That's center numbers. That's a guy that only dunks type of numbers. But much like Trey, I expect it to level off somewhat. And if he does move into a role where usage increases, and you're going to see that in a second when we talk about another player, um, that the two-point percentage will likely come down. So while if things clear up and there is a role for him that includes more minutes and more usage, we have to offset that with a probably likely decrease in two-point percentage. Jaron Jackson, one of the big stars of fantasy last season. Absolutely no debating that. A big surprise. I completely missed out on it. I had him at like 100 because I was just like, I'm not trusting the foot, man. Got a big man, broken foot coming into the season. I don't believe he'll be back. He was back immediately. He played 63 games, and he was a second-round producer. He averaged only 28 minutes a night, 18 points, 7 rebounds. The blocks were insane. But one thing that is a little bit understated, and by understated, I mean, I don't even think I've talked about it before. He went from 48% on twos to 58% on twos. That is a big leap forward. Now, part of the issue with Jaron Jackson in the previous season, and why we have no way of saying he's going to be a second-round guy outside of even the injury, is that the year before that, he shot 41 from the field, actually 41.5 overall, and 42.4 the year before that. They are really bad numbers as a big man. His interior or two-point finishing numbers were putrid. They were terrible. And it wasn't like limited numbers the year before. He played 78 games in 21-22 and shot just 47.6% from two. How was he able to transition that into shooting 59% this season? That's a really good question. It's really pretty simple when we look at it. Jaron went from a guy that took 33% of his attempts at the rim for three straight years and attempted 43% of them. That's that's it. He went. He took out some of the mid-rangers. He, he reduced his three-point shooting percentage 
not percentage, his uh, three-point attempt rate, down from, it had been 45, 42, 35, down to 30. He took fewer threes. He took fewer mid-ranges, down from 32% of his shots down to 27. And those two 5% decreases turned into a 10% increase at the rim. And then he also, at the rim, bumped his overall finishing number back from 58 to 66. So he took more shots at the rim, and he made more shots at the rim. That's it. And that's not unrealistic. The number of shots at the rim in all of his seasons, he was at 69%, 67%, 71%, dropped to 58% the year prior, and then 66% this season. So fair to say he is a high 60s finisher at the rim. And if he just maintains the same shot profile, there's no real reason why Jaron can't at least be mid to high 50s in two-pointers. So this, while this is a gigantic one-year leap from Jackson, it's not something that's impossible to continue. Today's episode is brought to you by eBay Motors. For a championship team, it's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit. It's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, you can be sure every every part that you need fits right the first time around. Just add your ride to my garage and look for the green check to know that the part will fit or your money back. Because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game when you shop on eBay Motors. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. So get the right parts, the right pit, the right fit, God, and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Broncos country, let's ride. eBay guaranteed fit is only available to U.S. customers, eligible items only, and exclusions apply. Okay, let's look at who dropped off in their two-pointers. Royce O'Neal. You're going to see a lot of Brooklyn players here. And my original thought on this, well, not even original, but the way I think this is, is that, yes, they all got older and worse, but also on a team where they weren't playing alongside, um, or in you know, O'Neal's case, Mitchell and Gobert the year before, um, Finney Smith's case next to Luca and uh, Brunson, and Bridges' case next to you know, Devin Booker, who are all on this list, by the way, O'Neal, Bridges, and Finney Smith, and going to a team, and I was going to say, look, it's not that they were playing with Kyrie and Durant in Brooklyn, because they all, well, O'Neal was to begin the year, but just forced into different roles. Royce went from a 61% two-point shooter to 38% the Basmati man. Now, that's horrible. He dropped off tons in his shooting. He also was able to weirdly increase and become a primary facilitator, which made no sense either. So somewhere like that Royce O'Neal drop, while I don't think he's going to be a good player and he is older and as a sub-elite player or sub-good player, once you hit that age, it's harder to get it back. Yeah, I don't believe he's a 38% two-point shooter. I also don't believe he's a 60% guy, but I think he's better than what he was. The in- in- interesting one here is Mikhail Bridges because he went from a 63% very low usage player in Phoenix the year before that to a much higher player, higher usage player, in Phoenix and in Brooklyn, of course, way more in Brooklyn, but lost tons of efficiency. Part of the reason Mikhail Bridges was able to be so successful in fantasy in previous years was a really strong steal rate, very, very good field goal percentage, and just solidness across the board and not missing games. Put into a larger role, his efficiency dropped, but his efficiency had dropped even before that in Phoenix. Going from 63% from two down to 51% is a major decline. And because of what, and I don't know, maybe Bridges has been traded by now, but I think the general rule of thumb is when you increase usage and increase role, your efficiency is not able to maintain. And Bridges really struggled in that regard a lot of the time. Um, over the, well, You can see there, it's just a gigantic drop-off in overall efficiency. And I think you've got to bake that into your analysis for him moving into this season. If he's still in a primary role as the number one offensive option, sure, his usage will stay high, but then the overall impact on your field goal percentage changes. And while 51% might not be what he sticks at, he might be able to take that and you know, move it to 54 or maybe push it back to 60. But being a 60% two-point finisher on high usage is just a really, really hard thing to do. It's it's so tough to be able to do that, and I'm not sure Bridges is that guy. Part of what happened to him is he fell off 11% on his rim finishing numbers, so couldn't finish at the rim at an elite number. He, f- he fell off on his mid-range shooting from 51 down to um, well, actually 48 in Brooklyn, but 41 in Phoenix. His three-point percentage stayed about the same. 
but he just didn't finish at the rim. And part of that is a lot more of his shots finishing at the rim have become more user-created because of him being that number one guy, being able to get in there and you know, improving your or, or you're creating your own shots is is a lot harder to do. And the numbers with that is that in previous seasons, his percentage of his shots at the rim that were assisted, 80%, 83%. This year in Brooklyn, 57%. So it's self-created. And self-created shots are harder to do. Therefore, the efficiency dropped off. And therefore, if I think he stays in that same role, we expect him to be more closer to 51 than he was to 63. Finney Smith went from 60 to 50. He just he struggled early on with some injuries. Some of that is then fit stuff in Brooklyn as well. Um, I also think that you're relying upon him to be a 60% shooter is not probably an ideal thing to do. So that will probably likely fall away. And then the other one that's really interesting here is Mitchell Robinson. And I, I don't, I don't really have an explanation for it. And Mitch Robinson says, I'll take it from here. But what it does do is that we talk about this, and we'll do a show on this on, at some point, talking about statistical outliers, like the top two, three, four at each stat, field goal percentage or steals or assists. And when looking at players like that, like expecting them to continue that, is it feasible? And Robinson went from being unbelievably unbelievable at field goal percentage. 76 is such a huge number, to also being unbelievable. But it's a big drop. He went from 76 to 61. Sorry, sorry. 76 to 67, which was previously 100th percentile and went back down to 93rd percentile. It's a it's a big fall away. And for fantasy, you go from excellent to still excellent, but not quite as excellent. And it has an overall impact on your production. Expecting 70 plus percent finishing or 70, 70 plus percent overall field goal percentage is a really tough thing to do. So that's why we always want to just sort of bump those guys down a little bit. Let's look at some players that improved their three-point percentage. Big news with the first one is Jared Vanderbilt Bar. He's not a big volume guy at all, but going from abominably at 14% to somewhat passable at 32% helped him. Now, that's obviously got to be the big focus of him in the offseason. He's still not going to play huge minutes well, yeah, next to Davis and LeBron, well, and because of his own offensive issues, but he probably will come in and start for the Lakers, I guess. Maybe, maybe they put Rui there. But that is a big step forward. I absolutely still don't buy Vanderbilt as a good shooter, but that was important. Colin Sexton went from 24 to 39. Yes, it was limited sample the year before that, but I think he is a pretty good shooter. I am quite critical of Colin Sexton as a player, or more importantly, as a player that you want to be a guy driving your offense. I don't think he's that. But as a sixth-man scoring type of player, he is an efficient guy who can do it on decent usage. And it was good to see, coming back from injury and then dealing with multiple injuries again, he was able to get the shooting back on track. TJ McConnell, he didn't really take a huge amount, but was able to be quite reliable from three. Now, I do not trust that for a single second. He did work a lot on his three-point shooting, he got it from 30 up to 44%. I just don't buy that he's going to be able to stay at that level. So when we're valuing TJ McConnell, uh, I think you've got to be pretty low on him heading into the year. One of the other ones, this has been a feature of this guy's career, Malcolm Brogdon. When he was a fourth option or whatever he was in Milwaukee, he was a 40% three-point shooter. When he went to Indiana to run the offense and be the number one option, he dropped way off. In his last season in Indiana, he was a 31% three-point shooter. He goes back to Boston, He's coming off the bench. He's lower in the pecking order. And he shot 44% from three. But the arm injury, elbow injury, that he is carrying into this new season, even if he plays more minutes than he did the year before, you don't want to bank on a 44% three-point shooter. And part of the reason he was able to be as successful as what he was is he turned his shooting from bad into very good. And that level of improvement probably means that it's going to level off somewhat heading into next season. Let's look at the guys who dropped off with their three-point percentage. We can talk about how disappointing Isaiah Hartenstein's season was, and it was. He had the opportunity to split some minutes with Mitchell Robinson. He had an opportunity early in the season when Robinson was hurt to establish himself. Um, the system was never great for him, but he also went from a 47% three-point shooter, not a realistic number, but he went to a number which is also not realistic, 22%. He just couldn't hit any shots. Yeah, realistically, he's probably a 32 to 34% guy who attempts one or two a game. 
But that's just such a huge difference in his overall production that he was he went from being that level of elite field goal percentage contributor in fantasy, which really helped his numbers with the Clippers, to being a guy that couldn't get anything to go. The Baptist, Johnny Collins, we know about the drop-off in him, but he went from passable three-point shooter, 36%, to 29 Now, his finger is all jacked up, and it was all jacked up all last season. I don't think we go into the season expecting John to be a 29% three-point shooter. So while I think the situation in Utah is very interesting. Does he get more minutes than he did in Atlanta? Does the shooting percentage come back to a normal level? I think all those things are pretty decent possibilities. And while Collins wasn't a top 100 player this season, I think he should be able to jump back into that area and relatively comfortably with Utah, assuming that he is going to start. Keldon Johnson, this is like the opposite of the Malcolm Brogdon scenario. Whose horse is that? Keldon went from shooting 40% three-pointers off of DeJounte Murray the year before, forced into a number one role, which he isn't suited to, and the efficiency wasn't there. And part of the issue with Keldon from a fantasy perspective is that he doesn't do anything in the rebounds, assists, steals, and blocks categories. And then his efficiency stuff really hurt. He went from a 19% usage player up to a 26% usage player. Now, that's a big jump to take on that number one role. And again, it's not a role he is suited for. But what that meant was that his shooting numbers dipped significantly. Now, he still finished at the rim at the same number, 62%, which is impressive. His uh, mid-range numbers were the same. He just couldn't hit threes. He was at 34% on threes, down from 40% the year before that. But also interesting, the year before that, he shot 34 as well. So is he like a 34% three-point shooter? Is he a 40% guy? I'm not sure. Most of his threes weren't self-created. Only 10% of them were. But the year before that, only 3% of them were self-created. So it's not he took on a larger, ro- a larger role for sure and did increase the amount of off-the-dribble threes he was taking. But it wasn't just that. It wasn't a huge, huge increase on you know, off-the-dribble threes. He went from 37th percentile to 64th in terms of off-the-dribble uh, off threes. So it's a, it is a jump. But he wasn't at the elite, elite level, the top level of taking those threes and that volume really killing him. So you've got to make a bet on that. Is that with Wembenyama coming in, with whatever else they're doing in free agency, does Johnson go to the number two option? Is he a bench player? Is he the third offensive option? And does that move that three-point percentage back up? I, I tend to think it doesn't make it back to 40. And maybe he is just a average to below average three-point guy. I, I don't. I wouldn't rule that out. Well, Gordon Haywood, he went from 39% down to 33%. And there's no real reason why that happened. Yes, he was hurt, as he is every year, but he just couldn't hit shots. And that's where I, it gets a little iffy with him. Now, his season's going to be worse because I'm guessing that Miles Bridges will be back. I know that they drafted Brandon Miller, and they both play a similar, if not the same, position to what Gordon Haywood does. So he's in strife in terms of getting the role that he had in the past. But the, the interesting thing with him is, while the three-point percentage fell off, he finished at the rim at 11% better, 62 versus 73. His mid-range shooting went from 41 to 47%. So just inexplicably, he couldn't hit uh, three-pointers. That probably is a little bit of an outlier, I'm guessing. I'm guessing. Let's look at overall field goal percentage. A couple of these names we talked about already, but Xavier T. Ilman, the cashier. One of the biggest rises went from 45% to 61%. I don't know how he was sitting there at 45% as a center who really doesn't do anything, but part of that is the small sample size for him, whereas this year he was able to take over at the end of the year as the starting center with Clark and Adams out, of course, but able to improve his overall effectiveness. Part of that was he was able to go back to finishing at the rim at a normal level. He was at 60% of the rim the year before that, which is 16th percentile for a big man. Dreadful. Back to 71 this season. His three-point percentage is negligible. And his mid-ranges, well, he doesn't take a huge amount there, but he did improve. But basically, he just went back to finishing at the rim at a normal level. And that bumped him back up. No reason he can't stay there. We talked about Jaron already. Went from 41 up to 51% shooting. Just a huge leap. Um, Trey Murphy went from 39 to 48. That's all that two-point percentage. And Larry Nance went from 52 up to 61% from the field. Nance, we know, was really important for that Pelicans team and probably an underrated uh, part of their decline. Yes, Zion's the major part, but Nance going down at times, I think, hurt that. And the Nance-Zion pairing is really useful. But he was also 
um, someone who, when he did play, that that overall field goal percentage was able to leap up pretty significantly, um, in large part because he just finished at the rim better than he did the year before. He was up to 74% uh, overall at the rim, which is a number that I worry a little bit about being able to stick, and then also what his role is going to be as we move forward here. The guys with the biggest drops in field goal percentage, Hartenstein, because the threes just cratered down from 63 to 54. We had um, Mitchie Robinson, which we talked about already, who finished at the rim at whatever percentage it was, 76 down to 67. Gigantic drop. And you probably expect 67 to 69 is a realistic expectation. 76 is just outlier while we're surprised. Royce O'Neal went from 46 down to 39. And Dorian Finney-Smith from 47 to 39. Now, O'Neal and Finney-Smith were guys that if you love a Dutch rider on a turnover category, you love these guys because, oh man, look, he's actually a 90th, even though he averaged 11 points a game, but he's never turned it over. So we loved having him on the on the team. But now they've turned into guys who aren't even, well, they're not, they weren't positive field goal guys, but they were okay field goal guys to being actually big negatives in that category. And I, I do worry, I think there's some bounce back for both of those players, but maybe not to the level that they were before, which would worry me somewhat about how we look at them. And I, I don't even know what team they're going to be on, but they're not going to be 12-team draftable players, would be my guess. Who improved their free throw percentage? A couple of interesting ones here. The Cockroach, Mason Plumley. Now, it didn't take much to improve from 39.8%. Didn't have, didn't have far to go. But he changed his free throw shooting motion to that weird left-handed push shot, and it went from 39 to 68. And he went from being an absolute must punt free throw percentage player to a, ah, maybe I can recover from this. Now, Plumlee's probably not, not probably, he's not going, and I don't even care where he ends up signing, he is not going to play the 32 minutes a night or so that he played as a member of the Charlotte Hornets. So we're not going to have to worry about him in fantasy too much, but that is a big improvement. Two, well, actually, we've got three other players here who all have history with the Houston Rockets. The Crucifix, Christian Wood, Went from 62% as a member of the Rockets to 77% as a member of the Dallas Mavericks. 77% for Wood on free throws makes him really, really useful. And one of the reasons that there were some people avoiding him last season was the fact that he just killed your percentages. Well, it turns out that that wasn't the case with his free throws. The reason you wanted to avoid him was because he's bad and Jason Kidd wouldn't play him. Where he goes to another team, I don't think another team would want to use him as a starter, But he is a high-usage player who can be useful in low minutes, especially if he keeps up that field goal percentage. Free throw percentage, sorry. Kevin Porter Jr. took gigantic steps forward last season. I have been a critic of Kevin Porter Jr. quite a bit. But I also said in the Houston season review show, like, he impressed. He had some good advanced metrics. He took big steps forward. He took his free throws from 64 up to 78%, which is totally passable. He became a very... and Actually, one of the things that did drop off for him was three-point percentage, which I think can come back up. But with the drafting of a men Thompson, with their flirtations with Fred Van Vliet, might be a reality, might not be, I don't know at this point. I don't know what the hell happens to Kevin Porter here. But he has taken big steps forward. He has shown pretty solid improvement. And while you probably don't want him to be your lead ball handler, he's shown enough to me that he can be at least some sort of a positive contributor, which he wasn't in the past. And taking that big step forward is important, and we hope that that can continue. And the other member, or former member of the Rockets, is Clint Capella who much like Plumlee went from a complete punt guy to a sort of punt guy, 47 from the line to 60% from the line. But let's be fair, we're not expecting Capella to be doing anything more than 55, 60 every year. He just went from abysmal to a bit less than abysmal, which is a W, but it doesn't impact stuff that much. Guys that dropped in their free throw, Stephen Adams went from a punt guy to a water while looking at punt guy. He went from 54 to 36 from the line. And we talked about it yesterday in rankings changes. Overall rankings really kill him because it dropped his number and made him look unrosterable. Whereas in effect, if you're a punt free throw guy, or even not even a punt, yeah, punt free throw guy, you're talking about a a top 70 player easily. Now I worry a little bit about his knee and his age, but he did take steps forward. Aaron Gordon went from 74 to 61. If he goes back to being a mid 70s free throw player, even if you consider him a punt free throw player, which he can, just getting an extra 14 percentage points on free throws means maybe that's an extra point per game through free throws. And that helps him in road history leagues as well. So he's got some scope. That was a re- really big drop-off. He's got some scope to improve. Al Horford. I bet you didn't know this because I didn't really even know it. Maybe you did. He went from an 84% free throw guy down to 71. That is a horrible drop. Now, his free throw volume is pretty low. 
And is he even still on the Celtics at this point? I'm not sure. But with the arrival of Chris Apps Porzingis, you think there's going to be a further destruction in his overall playing time. And I don't think that Horford's going to be a rosterable player, maybe in 12 team leagues. I don't know. But that's a little bit under... He shot like 44% from three. So he just had a weird year. His three-point shooting was well up. And Horford's free throw shooting just dropped way off. Down to a really bad 71%. I'll put the faith in Horford to be back around high 70s, low 80s in free throws. But it is something worth mentioning. And the last guy we're going to talk about as a big free throw drop, which I guess faded in some of the other drops that he had in his numbers, is the Rock DJ Robbie Williams. Williams went from 72%. When in his big breakout year to only 61% last season when there were all those troubles with his knee and returning from injury and sneaky Joe Mazzulla not playing him that much and his rebound rate dropping and so many things about his production dropped. He was still useful in the right head-to-head category league setting for sure. But like Horford, I, I do worry about what his overall upside is with his uh, injury problems and the presence currently of Horford and Porzingis on that team. So while I expect to be there to be improvements from Rob Williams this upcoming season, I'm not... Yeah, it's not a great scenario for a full, full bounce back. But part of the decline in his production overall and ranking decline is that bad free throw percentage. And there's no reason to suggest that he should be a 62% guy as we move forward. And guys, that'll do it for me today. Don't forget to follow this podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on the Odyssey app. And if you are here on YouTube, thumb it up and leave your comments down below. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.